Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. We are very, very happy with the partnerships that we've developed over the course of many, many years in presenting all different kinds of programs. But this is our first collaboration with the Sag Harbor Cinema. And, uh, and we're really excited to develop this new friendship and new creative partnership. Together, the parish and the cinema uh, invited a young talent from the region, filmmaker Michaela Duran, to guest curate this program. <laughs> Very excited about this about ways of seeing in our age of screens. And before we get started, I want to, uh, to introduce and welcome our partner, uh, Julia Vallon from the Sag Harbor Cinema. She's the artistic director. So Julia, if you want to say a few words, we will welcome you. Oh. Thank you very much. Just a few words to uh, thank the museum. We are very, very happy about this program. We started talking about it last spring, so it's long, it's been long in the works. And it's the relationship between film and the visual arts is something that it's incredibly exciting and it's been growing in the past several years. I come from the world of cinema and what the visual artists have brought to it is uh, a freedom, a narrative freedom, you know, stylistic interest. So it's all, it, it's, it's really great. And it's also very important for us to of to being able to have Michaela curating this program, being here both as a filmmaker and as a curator. And I want to uh, thank Minerva Perez from our board to have brought Michaela to our attention. And enjoy the program. And uh, my name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the senior curator of uh, Arts Region Special Projects here at the parish. Michael, I want to start with asking you what inspired you to put together a program of uh, short films in an age of social media where the watcher becomes the watched or those who are being observed become the narrator, and uh, which I think is very obvious in, in, in all of these films. So can you talk a little bit about uh, your idea, the concept, and how you found those films? Yeah, um, well, I guess an important part of this program for me was that these are all artists that are in my community and who I've known. I've known Jordan for since I was like 22. So that's like 10 years. <laughs> but I, I don't know, it's an urgent topic. I think for, you know, as a filmmaker and as a writer, I think it's really hard to tackle the internet today because the internet kind of kills your story in a way. You're confronted by this thing that is visually so cinematically unpleasant to look at in terms of an interface and screen. And it's just the moment that we live in, this like hyper stimulation, how we look isn't necessarily how we used to look, right? How we look, we're sometimes, we're really like voyeuristic in the state. We're imitating images that we desire. Our careers are also implicated with our brand and social media presence. So I wanted to, show artists who affected me when I was really young, like Paul Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. Laurel Nakadade, who I encountered. Right, these are the two older films. In, the, in yeah, the two the older program. films, the boxer film, where you don't see the boxers, and Laurel Nakadade, who dances to Britney Spears with these strangers that she encounters. Who, those films I saw in museums when I was super young, and then films that my contemporary peers are making. How do you see the difference between uh, particularly those two films by Laurel McAdady and Paul Pfeiffer and the other films that you chose? And why would you put them together in one program? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Laurel is interesting because at the time that she made her film, 2000. which was 2000, I think 2000, that was right before social media really took off. And the story with Laurel is actually she was 25 when she made those films. Her, her thing was that men would just approach her and hit on her. And she thought, OK, instead of rejecting them, can I turn this into an opportunity? And that's her dancing. <laughs> so she was like, if we're going to hang out, you're going to make a video with me. And some people 
men, all in this case, said no. And the ones who did, you saw on the screen. And so she, and this was kind of like before, you know, social media as we know it now, it's really normal to meet a stranger and mm -hmm. meet, have friends on social media and then meet them out. Back then it was dangerous. And it still is dangerous in some cases, <laughs> but it's so normalized today. And I think it really affected me when I saw these videos because, I mean, it was so brave. And I think when you're just young and in your 20s, you do things that you think can be done without consequence. Um, but I also feel like that is some of the greatest art I've seen is when people are really brave and don't think about it the consequences. And that's no longer possible, really, in, in, in our day and age, in a way. I mean, everything is, is captured, everything is commented on. And that brings me also to your film, I mean, both of your films, but I want to talk. Stay with Michaela for a minute. Your film, which is called First, and we experience everything, everything through their text messaging and them capturing everything that they do. And um, so can you talk a little bit about your, your film? Yeah, well, I wanted to make a film about the internet without showing the internet. And I think that desire came out of, I watch or we watch so many films made by filmmakers that portray the internet as this like matrix thing or this like very sensationalized thing. And the internet isn't really like that, the way that we experience it. It can be that, it can be really exciting but it can also be really boring. <laughs> like, I think a lot of the time we're just on our phones and then we're waiting to feel something. And once we do, we can get off of it. But I, I wanted the internet, the way we experience it today, it's like a hum in the background of our lives. It's a seamless thing. We're like intertwined with it. And I just, I, I wanted to make a film that shows that. Right, and um, the title of your film, can you? Talk about why you named it first. It's called First because I originally wrote a feature that revolved around these two characters, this girl who's 16 who you saw and her older brother. But because I couldn't find funding for it, I turned it into a trilogy of shorts. So this is the first one. And so it speaks to that. But it also speaks to, there's this thing that happens on Instagram with teenagers mostly where if a celebrity posts a photo on Instagram, they want to be the first to comment, and so they'll comment first. And so it's, you get all these at the same time when like Kylie Jenner posts a photo, you'll see like 50 teenagers post first to be the first one, but they're, all the firsts are like the thousand first or something. It's a world I didn't grow up with. <laughs> Jordan, you are the filmmaker of the film called Access, about your own heart surgery. What prompted you to make a film about this incredible, incredibly scary life event? Mm. Yeah, so um, something that I've you know, just been interested in about filmmaking in general is this kind of problem of bodies and mm -hmm. how bodies are both what film wants to show, but also what it can't really get inside the feeling of. You can show the outside of a body, you can show all these pictures of the inside of a body, but you can't really show. It's something that, like sight, uh, there's a limit there of, of what um, can really be expressed through vision. And so that actually really related to a lot of conversations I was having uh, in disability community around an idea of both like how we privilege sight, but then also what touch might be instead. And I'm, so I'm very interested in things that are too close to, too close to see, or where the closer you get to them, actually like the less you can see of them. And so when I was told that I was gonna have these people go inside of my body, and I was in the process of that, seeing all these images of the inside of my body, I was thinking about, okay, so like what would it mean to show this on camera and particularly like I was gonna be unconscious for the surgery and I was like, okay, well this is something that I literally couldn't see for myself and the only way that I would sort of know what was happening is if I could see what somebody else was seeing in this experience and so 
that was when I approached the hospital. And then, of course, you see in the film, I did not get access to um, <laughs> having uh, those images. But that, that was a lot of where the idea came from for the film. Right, and was this idea of commenting everything through your uh, voiceover as well as subtitle, was that something that helped you process the whole experience and, and mm. the way you you present it as, a, as, a, as an artwork, as a film. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the sort of fundamental reason why everything is described in the film, of course, is for access, is for accessibility right. in the sense that audio description is kind of the equivalent to closed captioning for deaf audiences. Audio description is a form of accessibility for blind and low vision audiences. And I was thinking especially about, like, so that, that was really the main impetus for having that in there came from um, and thinking about how this kind of access on the level of disability relates to the access I was denied in terms of this structure. But of so much of what I experienced in the process of going through this surgery and going through navigating the kind of Western medical industrial complex was this real disconnect around different kinds of access where... I would get access to certain kinds of information, but then other access would be denied. For instance, like the main symptom I felt the entire time leading up to the surgery that even let me know that there was something wrong that <laughs> caused me to then have the surgery, no doctor could really explain to me what it was that I was feeling. And at the same time, every test that they could run, I didn't, all the things that those tests measured for were things I couldn't feel. And so where that disconnect is around access to information or access to embodied sensation, I think that was something that making a film like this was really helpful for me uh, in terms of processing. Right, right. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the notion of mortality, which I know Rachel Rose, who was the filmmaker of the first film, talked about when she made that film, she interviewed a... Um, as an astronaut um, going into space and having that feeling of total disconnect of, of out-of-body experience and then coming back to, to Earth and, and sort of, you know, having his senses again, uh, having these sensory experiences again. And I just want to ask you both about, it seems like media today gives us access to everything, uh, makes us feel like omnipotent, makes us feel like immortal infinite and yet it seems like the more access we have to these things also the the more we feel our actual mortality our, our the finite notion of ourselves and and it feels like that that's somehow coming through in in this film in these films and, and obviously in particular in, in your film as well mm. but you yeah. we talk a little bit about the, the way that media gives us this uh, impression of, of everything is accessible and everything we can do everything right mm. but it seems at the same time we're also experiencing our mortality mm. much more um, closely. Mm. Yeah, well, I think specifically with Rachel's film, I know Rachel very well, and when I first met her, she was like a hypochondriac, mm. <laughs> which I think is like a, a really important part of her work. I don't think she's, I think she's figured a way to deal with that, but I, what I see in her work and what, what I like about these films that I, I know most of these artists and I can see how they're just trying to deal with their mortality through creating this form that we're seeing. And I think a way for her to deal with her mortality was by talking to this NASA astronaut that she heard once on the radio and then emailed obsessively to, <laughs> to talk about what did it feel like to feel like you were completely disembodied. Mm -hmm. And I love her for that, because mm -hmm. I don't know many people who would do that. But I think in terms of mortality, I don't know, do I think about my mortality? I think I think about how today, the way that we exist and interact, I feel I'm more like disembodiment, actually, mm -hmm. than I do. I feel like you probably felt your mortality yeah. 150%. Hmm. Well, it's like, yeah, obviously in the lead up to the surgery, I was thinking a lot about mortality and about the risks involved in the surgery. But I think a lot of what your question makes me think of, even though it's sort of to the side of life or death, is like in this process of trying to capture everything, what I feel like you really start to see is everything you can't capture. You know, that, that's really what I see when I see this film, is everything that couldn't go in. You know, that even, like, despite all of this presence of cameras and 
this sort of sense that we're always being watched, then there's like uh, somehow like the part is, t it's just too many parts to ever be put together into the whole. And, and all, of the, all of the gaps are like these black spaces and, and my film I, I think are like really trying to think about like everything that we see, you know, is a frame through the, you know, everything we see through the lens of the camera is a frame and so it's like also everything it cuts out too. Right, and, and you're talking actually about reversing the, the rules of filmmaking, like show, mm. don't tell, but, and you're like, no, I'm actually going to tell, and, yeah. and, and it and actually adds a dimension, mm. right? It adds something to the, to the story. And uh, so I was really, it was nice to see all the, the different media, the techniques, and the approaches of the different filmmakers all come together in, in, in this program. Yeah. Can you say a little bit something about why you included um, Paul Pfeiffer's work, which is also an older work, that that's the one of the boxes that are erased from the, the video. And we just kind of hear them breathing and, and we're sort of like in their body looking at the audience. Yeah, just incredible just by omitting these figures but hearing them. I think I thought that was quite, um, quite yeah. an experience. Uh, well, Paul Pfeiffer was probably one of the first video artists that I was exposed to on YouTube, I think, mm. when I was in high school. And I I, I mean, he's like a icon, legendary video artist whose technique is really creating the narrative through editing. And usually we think of editing in a film as a secondary act, but in his it's like everything. Mm -hmm. That was the third fight between Ali and Joe Frazier in mm -hmm. 1975. He had done this series that he calls the Long Count series of Ali fighting. And I think it's, it's really interesting because when you see each of those videos, that, that was the first fight that actually HBO had broadcast through satellite to a billion people. And it was this huge event. At the time also in America, boxing was the cultural event. And there's so many things about it. I mean what we see is the audience looking back at exactly. us. Yeah. And so he's kind of showing, but we can, we can see these ghostly outlines moving around in the ring and dancing around. And what we're really seeing is, is the tension and, and kind of the labor. We hear the labor of what it means to fight and be mm. in this ring and the spectacle of it. I think also just the racial tensions that were and what it meant to be a boxer at that time, boxing, was a way to kind of transcend race, even though it didn't, you right. know? Um, and Ali was really outspoken, and he wasn't the perfect ambassador to white people of what, like, a black boxer should be. Um, and I think he's playing into that. Um, Paul is showing us that this is a tense environment and rendering something that we usually see as invisible, visible. Exactly. And uh, Simon Liu's e-ticket, um, that's the one with the frantic sort of travelogue images. Um, yeah, Simon, I mean, what's interesting about Simon is that film is basically, he had all these photographs that he had taken mm -hmm. on vacation, and he's from Hong Kong, and he didn't know what to do with them, and so this was a way for him to kind of make a narrative and reconstruct these memories into a film. And I think what I like about experiencing that film, I think some of the best experimental art I've seen, I've like fallen asleep to, <laughs> or like zoned out. I think his film is kind of makes you go into this internal place and then you can come back. It's like being in the city. When you're in the city, you can go away for five years and you come back and people think you were just gone for the weekend. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird metaphor for this film, maybe, but I, I feel that way about his one. film. Like, you can yeah. come back to it. And I think also social media in the very beginning, it was made like so that you could maybe have control over what you see. And now we know that's not the case. We have no control right. over what we see. The algorithm has taken us. It's like leads us to like order mac and cheese on Seamless or something, you know? Right. We, we've become the object in, right. in, in, in social media. And his, his, the experience of his film feels like that to me. Right. Like it's confronting you. Before we open it up to the audience, I want to ask you both a question. Um, 
Can you imagine life after social media? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I think so. Sure. But you had a longer answer when we talked earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> just want to hear that. <laughs> life, life without social media? Or can, or you, life can you imagine life without social media or post-social media? Or what does social media mean to you or also to your art, you know, mm. and your art making? I think that there is no way to separate ourselves from social media. I think when we really, we're from a generation that where your career can be built out of just having a popular Instagram or where journalists now who are working today feel the need to have a successful Twitter personality and craft really clever messages. And I think that social media, maybe sometimes people think that we're just talking to our friends or trying to find suitable romantic partners, but it's actually so intertwined with our work. We answer emails on our phone, you know? And, and I think maybe the answer is trying to find a way to negotiate how we do use our screen time mm -hmm. um, rather than totally uh, erasing it from our lives, which I think is impossible. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I'm only thinking of this now, really, but it's like, I guess my hope for like a world without social media would be, or like a world beyond social media, is like a world where we like move beyond the image because we're so like governed by images as the way that our world is filtered. And of course, as we know, image is only like one among many ways of engaging with the world. And so I think that what's interesting about like disability community, for example, on something like Instagram is that there's people who are constantly engaged in the act of trying to render this extremely inaccessible environment accessible to others. And then that has facilitated like real forms of community and care. And I think that's like more what I hope we can move toward is like a way where like, you know, one, one sense, one form of encountering and perceiving the world isn't privileged over others. And we can kind of, we can experience uh, a kind of multiplicity of ways of engaging, which I think is maybe a strangely hopeful thing to say, considering how hopeless the world feels sometimes. But I feel, when I see those kinds of forms of community springing up on social media, then I feel more hopeful. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both. And I want to open, up, open it up to the audience, if anybody has any questions for Michaela or Jordan in the back. Oh, he said, um, how did Paul Pfeiffer, the boxing video, what was that effect that he did? It was, um, I think it's like rotoscoping. He basically surveyed the crowd back and forth and then tried to make up the image within, because the camera just moves back and mm -hmm. forth in the ring, he could create the image again. And you see the shadows sometimes. Of yeah, the, and sometimes the you see the outlines. The outlines, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? April? I might be too oh. old to be asking this question. But, and you've curated a certain direction in the film where I see some moments of fascination or passing interest, but no story. So my question is, do you think that the notion that we as human beings need story is breaking down in your generation? I think that's, I think it's interesting how maybe we think about story. For me, these films are an experience or a journey, and I think that when we follow someone online, they take us with them, and sometimes nothing happens, we're, but we're so fascinated by who they are and the way that they're telling it and showing it to us, and maybe revealing and performing for us. And I think that maybe these, like, mainstream movies want you to follow a character and want you to see them get trampled and then want you to see them rise to fame and find some balance. And those are stories. And I'm, I'm interested more in the journey, I think. And I think these films take us on that, a journey. I think I have an answer to that too, which is just like, I think it's ironic that 
um, obviously like Instagram, like the platform, one of the main re ways that people kind of communicate cinematically or through video is through this thing called stories. But then like they're hardly ever like what we think of usually as stories and all that defines a story is simply a frame. It's literally saying, this is the frame I've chosen to show you right now. And I think that weirdly like we're getting closer to like the kind of like story at its most base level, which is the frame, which is like not just like, oh, like for corners or whatever, but also like this idea of like being framed or the kind of like a kind of like falseness to that in some way. Like and yeah. April. To that point, I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, this is like, I'm an artist and I'm really used to seeing films made by artists who don't have particular narratives. I don't really about that that much. It's, it was interesting though how um, all these films pretty much used they're kind of fracturing mm -hmm. as a way of expressing reality and that interests me. And I was just wondering as filmmakers, do you care if people think of this as like art or film or art video or and I'm not sure you have a, a kind of a kind of political position that you want to take or that you care about? Not really. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think it's really, it's interesting because we've been thinking, I mean, Corinne asked us earlier, do you consider what you make art or film and do you want it to exist in the art world or the film world? But I think what's exciting about this time right now is that we're seeing a new kind of cinema and we're experiencing that cinema on our screens. And there's a hybrid of art and film happening. So, I mean, for me, I just want my film to be played on a good projector <laughs> in a place that's dark and has good sound. It's called a movie theater. Yeah, <laughs> a movie theater, but this here too. But you know, I, I think, yeah, like those are my requirements, but I also think, and we both think about accessibility. Like I think we would both want our film to be downloaded and stolen someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's like the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like these films could be seen in any different uh, mode and format. Uh, and I know that Rachel Rose's has been shown as an installation, for example. So Right. Mm -hmm. Paul's and Rachel's Paul, are usually yeah. shown as installations. Yeah. And also Laurel's. Right. Mm -hmm. One last question. Yes. Tripoli. Um, yeah, I'm very enjoyable watching. Uh, I was kind of going to ask a question that was similar to April's, but I'm going to merge it a little bit. And what, was it hard to be a filmmaker as well as putting together an event and work with different artists? I think putting an event is always hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes and no. I think because these were my friends, I wanted to also be professional. And I don't know, I mean, all work today is admin. It's like writing emails and making images and posters and making sure the font is okay. You know, so <laughs> it was hard and it wasn't. I've had to do that a lot in my life. But I think just thinking, I, I mean, watching this here, I, I mean, like when I saw your film, I almost wanted to cry because there was such a tender moment when your mom was on screen. And I almost felt like I was seeing you as a new person mm. watching the film, even though you're sitting right there next to me, you know, <laughs> and I know you. So yeah, I mean, I think it's always hard to kind of see your friends make something that goes beyond them and outside of them, but it only makes me excited to see it. I, I think, think to your point, I think it does make a difference how you, how you actually watch it, because it was different for me watching it, you know, on the, computer screen and, and seeing it tonight, mm -hmm. it actually, it does make a difference. So I just want to conclude the program, thanking both of you for coming tonight and to Michaela for putting together the, the program. Thank you. Thank you.